Everyone, sorry about that. I missed the broadcast to YouTube check checkbox, so I had to restart. People on YouTube probably didn't have an issue, but uh, apparently I'm having issues today. Let's see if this works. Hey, we're live now. Right on. And there's an ad. Let me pop out chat. You guys should click our ads so we get the so they can buy some Starbucks. Yeah, feel free. <laughs> feel free to click on as many as you like. You know, I'm halfway tempted just to turn off YouTube ads because you know it ends up being, you know, maybe a hundred bucks a month. But I knows? did it and I didn't know it noticed any difference on SEO this week. So I turned them on and then turned them off and then turned them on again. There's no change in viewership or any of that. Now. Yeah, you know, I think our viewers put up with it, but you know what I've what I've been doing is it produces about a hundred bucks uh, a month, and so I just get a hundred bucks of channel ads and promote the channel. So yeah. it's probably worth doing. Well, all I'll do is I'm going to start targeting this channel to. Advertise for digital ear and what ranks? <laughs> that makes I, sense. I wish Chad or uh, Craig Campbell would turn on advertising on his channel. I'd advertise all over his. You see how many viewers he had today? Like four thousand live. That's awesome. Yeah, that's an impressive number. It is. Knowing his black hat, you wonder if he's got four thousand mobile phones watching his shit. <laughs> Well, you know, something else that probably appeals to a lot of people, too, is that um, you probably get the people that want to learn what he's doing, but you also get the people that want to hate on what he's doing. Yeah. Like, like they, they want to see it for, like, the NASCAR wreck. <laughs> you know, like, you know, the people that are watching just to see those cars wreck, not, they don't really care about the race. Right. It's got to be the same kind of viewer, right? He had his own audience, well, too, right? And he grew an audience by doing all those webinars for Samrush at one point. And he, he still does, as I understand it, I think he still does webinars for SCM Rush. I think that's been a big way for him to, to build and grow, which is not a bad way to do it. And you have to kind of segment the beginners versus the, you know, experienced SEOs, because how many of those thousands of people are going to ask, what's a heading tag? Right. And, you know, uh, that's kind of the problem I, I get like trying to sell my software. I bet you get this too, Kyle, is you you get, you know, seasoned SEOs that can like hit the ground running and they can do great things. And then you get beginners who are like, what's HTML? And, you know, you just want to pull your hair out and scream. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, it if you go between the different YouTube channels, especially about SEO, you get different degrees of that. Like when I'm on uh, Chase's show, I get a much higher concentration of beginners mm -hmm. than if I go on to, you know, other channels where you get more seasoned pros. Chase has done a really good job of marketing that channel too. And then he's been around like forever. Like I remember when him and I were on Blab together and then he moved over to YouTube. Now he's Chase is actually doing the webinar with this so. Oh, you got to not rock because every time you leave, when you run back, you, you grow out entirely. <laughs> <laughs> it's like I think that was the important part. <laughs> I was gonna yeah. say he, he um, Chase is actually doing a really good job with that channel. That's you know SEO wise, him and I would probably never agree, but you cannot deny the results he's done with his YouTube stuff, and he's gotten him a lot of attention, and, and he's actually doing a webinar on SEO. Yeah, you know, uh, what I've noticed with uh, Chase is that his marketing fundamentals are are pretty good. You know, he's, he's all about targeting and your marketing message and your calls to action and, mm -hmm. and all the things that marketers in general need to do. Right. Uh, yeah, he's... He's somewhat good about evidence-based methods in the sense that he shows good good results. So he has, 
you know, good case studies. He shows meaningful results, like I got significant uplift in sales and real traffic. Whereas, you know, on other uh, SEO shows, you see people, they, you know, show a chart. And when you really analyze the chart, it's a no op, it's a no result. Mm -hmm. So he's decent there. He's bad on testing. He's bad on scientific evidence, but that's not his thing. He's kind of, you know, he's an SEO with general marketing skills, and that's fine. Uh, his channel has a lot of beginners, so he has to do a lot of entry-level uh, concepts and education. He can't dive deep into technical stuff because his audience will just have a ton of question marks. Yep. And so, yeah, you know. Well, that's what Onyx Single did, too, and and this might be something for IMG and it's certainly something for SIA is those newbies are always new. You know what I mean? They're always there. They're always coming in. There's always a crop of newbies. Exactly. Coming in. That's where yeah. the money's at. And if you target them, you're, you're going to have longer term success. So. But the, you know, the downside to that is you have to really dumb down your content, not to put down the newbies, but you have to constantly do entry level content. And that's what I'm running into. Not to say that they're morons, but they're complete morons. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, that's what I'm running well, into with my course, and I'm building it, and I'm like, oh man, this is really basic. You know what I mean? Who's gonna, who's gonna want this? And then I gotta smack myself in the head and remember, newbies will be watching this. Too. Everyone, yeah. But even still, everybody likes a refresher too. What I've noticed as well, even people that are quite seasoned, mm -hmm. like, oh, you know, it's nice to hear that every once in a while I kind of get back to it. Maybe you you missed a step here or there, or got complacent in this or that. So. It's it's a, a funny thing because it definitely does target to people who are fresh coming in, but also people who are seasoned like it too. Yeah. yeah, and you know Chase would be the first to admit that I neglect the newbies and I geek speak over the top of their heads and I do all the <laughs> you yeah all the terrible things. <laughs> well, that's but, why you, you two know, have a translator. This guy. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but but at the same time, he has the opposite problem. Like we have a ton of people who are in our community who say, yeah, I got started watching Chase, but you know, then I, I came over here once I learned my stuff, they graduate from Chase and they get away from that beginner content. Yeah. And, but you know, to Clint's point though, is that that's, that's the, that's the smaller sliver of the market that actually make that jump. Cause I think at every point in somebody's life, they have the idea of I'm going to make money online. Yeah. You know, everybody's got that thought. Like, why yeah. can't I do that? They know they they know some idiot that's making like five thousand a month doing nothing. Like, I could do that. Do it better. And then, uh, so they then jump into the newbie stuff as they have to to try to learn. And then then some make it and some don't. Well, and the other thing to note is that there's plenty of market. Like, it's good that Chase is out there offering content to beginners so that I don't have to because that's not my slice of the market. We can coexist with that arrangement. Well, Onyx Single and Cotton and Grammar, that's what they're doing. They're making, making millions just targeting newbies. That's all they do. So. Onyx, I know, has been quite successful doing that. Yep. Well, I guess we should get into today's topic. Let me share my... And Ted, we're going to have to cut about 13 of these slides now that we went about eight minutes into this. Uh, well, I'll go pretty quickly. We're talking about page speed. How long Don't listen to it? Kyle. He does, he's at his in-law's house. He's got sandwich next to him. <laughs> <laughs> gotta get out of here, man. I gotta get out of here. <clears throat> All right. Improving page speed. So... Uh, we have this contest. We're giving away a cool uh, WordPress plugin called uh, Link Whisperer that does internal linking, uh, contextual links. If you want to get this awesome prize, uh, just uh, join IMG, complete your profile, including the picture, and post a comment on the comment thread. And we'll announce the winner uh, You know, next week. So you're running out of time to enter. So please do that. Uh, Clint, what's new on SEO this week? Ted, while he's coming on, something that I wanted to mention is that um, Link Whisperer is brought to you by the same pro. So it's not some fly-by-night 
organization doing some software. They're, they're very successful in the SEO game, and, and this is a, a good thing to jump on. Yeah, and they're making a lot of updates to that thing and making it much better. So definitely worth it. If anything, what does it take you? You sign up and sign up to the group and you get a chance to get it for free. So. Uh, SEO this week, uh, not too many stories, not too many tools, but we did have uh, Brad Mayberry and Mike Pearson talked a little bit about PBNs and their concept of mini nets. And then we talked a lot about automation and then looking at different or alternative ways to make money. I mean, agency is not necessarily the only way to go. You can do affiliate uh, or PPL, etc. And on the topic of PPL, they offered a seven day access to their PPL training, uh, NFG monthly. So check it out. Very cool. So, yeah, if you haven't seen SEO this week, check it out. It's another YouTube show. Uh, it's one definitely worth watching. So page speed, uh, specifically improving page, uh, page speed and the technical uh, aspects of that is what we're diving into. I'm not going to go into doing a page speed audit and those tools. I think everyone has seen that stuff to death. If you haven't, there, you know, just Google page speed and there'll be a million tutorials. I, I want to go a, a bit deeper into what you can actually do about it. And so the first tactic is converting things that are images to not being images. And so like in e-commerce, one of the culprits is sizing charts. You'll see stuff like this all the time where it's just a chart of text and they'll make it a big image. And, you know, it doesn't need to be. That could just be HTML and be, you know, one twentieth the size of what the image is. So take note of when you don't need images and there's a lot of stuff that you can do in HTML and CSS that can eliminate the need to have images at all. So, you know, somebody wants a drop shadow on some text, so they go into Photoshop and make a graphic. Well, you can do that with style sheets. That image isn't even necessary. And not only is the image slow, but the extra asynchronous request to fetch that image is also something that's unnecessary. And we'll talk more about that later. And then of course, there's the other classic of, you know, scaling images to the correct size. This is the one that drives most of us nuts is when there's some huge graphic that gets scaled down uh, dynamically to be a little icon to click on. Uh, you know, these things should be resized to be the appropriate size so they don't have to be scaled down. <clears throat> and then, of course, image compression. Uh, save for web and Photoshop is quite possibly one of the most influential uh, software features ever built for optimizing page speed. So if you haven't uh, seen that, uh, you should look for the save for web options in your graphics tools. And specifically, if you use uh, a lot of photos, you know, using JPEGs and, and using compression, it can be amazing. Like, you know, this uh, image was almost three megabytes. When you add compression, it looks the same to me. I mean, there's subtle differences in it, but... As far as I could tell, it was the same, and it was 41 kilobytes afterwards. That's almost 99% smaller. Um, so image compression can be a huge game changer. But those are like the common things. Like we all know of those. We've heard of those. Um, what people often don't think of about those images is that when you don't host them on a CDN, when you host them on your own server, your own server is set up for a context of web pages. So it's going to put all the headers, it's going to put all the cookies, even your one by one spacer pixels that you may have in your theme 
are going to send all this extra information with that pixel. And in this case, this one website, every image is repeating the same 29 text cookies. And some of these images might be one pixel images that have 29 cookies of data shipping with it across the network. So when we look at that, you know, here's the, the list of cookies uh, for that one image. You know, we have uh, 3,500 bytes of image in this case. And, you know, geez, almost half of that is just text from cookies. So if you put the image, if you take these images off of your local server and you put them on a CDN, none of this gets sent. The CDNs don't send cookies with the images. So all you're sending is just the image source and not all the unnecessary uh, HTTP headers that are going to just bulk up all the transfer and slow everything down. And if your template has hundreds of images, then you're really slowing it down by not using a CDN. And CDNs have another benefit. They reduce web server logging. So if your theme in WordPress has, you know, 200 little tiny formatting images throughout the theme, all of those images, when they get requested, they're going to be logged in your web server log files. Every time you visit a page, every single image is going to get its own line in the logs. And that's a ton of disk I.O. So every time somebody visits the page, gets those locally served images, your web server then has to write files to a disk for every image that was viewed. Oh, the pixel got viewed by this user agent on this date. Every single one of them. So when you put those images out on a CDN, your web server no longer has to log all that crap, which you're never going to use. You don't care who saw what spacer pixel on what date. You're never going to look at that. So why log it? Put it out on the CDN get rid of the cookies, get rid of the unnecessary headers. The CDM probably has a faster internet connection than your server anyway, and eliminate the log file IO for tracking the, the views of all those images. You don't need it. You still get the log file views of the page. You still get the information you need. You just don't need to know who saw the spacer pixels. Ted, if I'm just running kind of regular hosting a WordPress site on a on a regular type host, am I am I running into all these problems? Do all these things exist? Yeah, yeah. If if you get uh, cPanel hosting and set up WordPress, uh, you've just shot your page speed in the foot. And typically, what you want to do is get somebody who knows how to edit themes to put all the images of your theme of your website out on S3. And then all you're really doing is changing the URLs of those images from your local server to your S3. And what's amazing- Clint, is this something Go ahead. That, that you have in your optimization service? Uh, no, because you have to buy W3 off, WP offload. I don't know if you guys heard of that before, but it does what Ted's saying. It takes all of your images puts them all on S3 for you and then changes all your URLs and your theme. And we don't offer it because that would require the customer to give us access to their S3 account uh, on top of having to buy another license of that tool for them. Huh. There was WP offloader. WP offload. I'll get the link. Offload. Q. Yeah. And it's, you know, it's an important thing to do because S3 is so cheap. Like anybody who uses S3, you know, my my last S3 bill was like 74 cents. And that was all my graphics and my software downloads and everything. I just can't believe how how cheap S3 is for CDN usage. 
So it's something that, you know, I think everybody should really consider and look into. And what's amazing uh, when I offload all my images to the CDN is how small the log files get. I'd go from having gigabyte log files to having, you know, one or two megabyte log files. And the information in those log files becomes really interesting and useful because all the garbage information about the spacer pixels is removed. It's gone. So what's left is actually the usage information I'm I'm interested in. Who visited what page and you know, where did they come from? Where did they go to? I don't really care about which spacer graphics they saw. And so when all of that is out of those log files, all of a sudden those log files are useful and manageable. And so I think it's an important thing to keep in mind is your your data gets better when you make this change. <clears throat> Another uh, way to speed up uh, your website is H2. And a lot of people aren't going to know what H2 is, but there are standards for the protocol that web browsers use. And for you know the past 15 years, we've been using HTTP 1.1. And the next version of that is called H2. And for the past two years, it's kind of been a slow rollout, slow adoption. Browsers kind of support it, and it's a little bit buggy on some browsers and others. But it's so fast. Here I have a website that's split. Some assets are the old version. Some assets are the new version. And we can see here that the file size being transferred in many cases is, you know, five, 10 times larger. And it's at one tenth the transfer speed. So that's, you know, better than a 10 X performance improvement by turning on H2 on the web server. Problem is not everybody can do that. Some hosting, you don't have access to it. Some uh, flavors of web servers aren't easy to configure. Uh, but if you have a system admin, if you have a, a technical person on your staff that can look into it, look into turning on H2 on your web server and you could get this performance improvement. <clears throat> and Asynchronous uh, connections is the next thing that people don't think about. They get a theme that has 500 little tiny images on it. It includes, you know, 14 different JavaScript libraries. It includes, you know, 27 different CSS files. It has 13 different web fonts. All of those are another web request that the browser has to make to load those resources off the network somewhere. And this one page, just to view this one page I'm looking at, the browser had to make almost 1,400 other web requests just to honor that page view. And those 1,400 web requests were almost 13 megabytes of file transfer per page view. It's insane. You know, if if you had just the text from, you know, the New York City phone book, that's about two megabytes. This is six New York City phone books per page view. That's obscene. And so eliminating these parallel requests will speed up your website because Chrome and other browsers will only do like five or 10 at a time. So it's gonna bottleneck once you hit that uh, parallel request uh, cap. And so if you want your page to go faster, you gotta have as few of these asynchronous requests as possible. And you can see this by using the network inspector and the Chrome inspection tools and looking at the waterfall. That's where you get this information.
caching is another area where people uh, tend to run in horror from because caching cuts both ways. <clears throat> the idea behind caching is that your browser will save the content it downloaded. So the next time you visit the page, it won't request it at all. And it has different kinds of caching. So in-memory caching is typically for the page you're currently looking at. So if you have a pixel graphic that appears 14 times on the page, it's going to load it once and then refer to it from memory cache 13 more times and save those transfers. The disk cache is for web pages you've been to recently. So this might be a page you were at a few hours ago. It might be a page you were at a couple of days ago. If it hasn't expired out of cache, it'll just reload it off of your hard drive instead of downloading it again from the network. And you can see the in-memory cache, zero time. Like, it's super fast. The disk cache, couple milliseconds. That's really close to zero time. And then the raw requests, well, now you're actually using clock time. So the idea behind caching is you're saving uh, that load time. You get a fast website for returning visitors. New visitors, however, always get the slow time because it's never in cache. They have to download it. So caching only works for returning visitors. And the other problem with caching is that nobody knows when to set the, the expiration on the content. If you set it for two weeks, well, that product might have sold out four days ago. So two weeks probably isn't right. Uh, but if you set it for 10 minutes, well, you're probably going to download the content more often than you need to. So there's an art to setting the right cash expiration. And because of that, people oftentimes just want to disable the cash. They're like, no, no, give me the, the latest version every time I request it. I want to see the change instantly. And uh, people forget to clear their cache so they can see updates and things of that nature. But there's a lot to be had with caching, especially with WordPress, because if you can cache a blog post that isn't going to change quickly, then your website's going to be so much faster. So there's a, a number of caching plugins for WordPress and for applications like blogs makes all the sense in the world to cache heavy. Uh, if you have something that's more real time, like inventory management on an, on an online retail store, then maybe you're going to shy away from caching a, a bit more. But what do you guys think of caching? I like it. It's probably, other than minification, is the one that's most effective in getting the speeds down and getting those done right. Um, but they do, like you said, they do have some drawbacks. I was just fighting with the site the other day. Uh, it was on AWS, and, and those ca that cache... Like took days to clear. No matter what you did and how many buttons you mashed, it always got stuck. So just be prepared to deal with that a little bit as well. Yeah, that's the only negative that I've seen as well is that um, with uh, some caching uh, at the hosting level that it won't clear out. And so people will make changes. I see this most with often like pop users. Like I'm making changes and pop isn't picking it up. And I'm like, well, it's because your hosting is, <laughs> is serving a cached page when we go to crawl it. Um, and they don't realize that it's a frustrating experience. It's also frustrating, not just in when running a tool, but as Clint mentioned, you know, they made changes to the page and they want to see them. Uh, that can take a while. Yeah. So, but it's definitely something where depending upon the purpose of your content, you may want to look into more heavily. And I'd say anything that's like news related or blog post related or editorial where you're not dealing with something real time like inventory management, that's an ideal thing for some pretty heavy caching. And that'll probably speed up your website for returning visitors tremendously. 
lazy load is something that often comes up with CDNs. Uh, people will often make an argument that sounds like, oh, I don't need caching. I don't need CDNs because I've got a lazy load plugin. It, it has some problems. The, the first one is you don't actually get the benefits of the other things. You're not making zero time page loads for returning visitors. You're not eliminating the burden of unnecessary logging. You're not eliminating the cookie bloat and header bloat from local hosting. Uh, all lazy load is doing is saying, don't load this unless it's in the viewport. And that operation in many implementations can be problematic for so people that uh, infinite scroll and lazy load category pages often find that Google never visits or indexes pages two plus because Google isn't going to scroll the page for you and there's a lot of behaviors in that and so for SEO reasons lazy load can can be a little bit tricky, especially if you're trying to use it on a larger scale website. Uh, what are your experiences with lazy load? My personal experience has been not great um, in terms of like you were just saying with indexation issues, but it also seems just to cause problems. Like when sites are having issues, you can, one of the things that's kind of an underlying common denominator is often uh, an infinite scroll or a lazy load. Uh, usually one of the first places I look for problems is lazy load and other, you know, other things like that, things that are related to lazy load. So categories, faceted navigation, uh, infinite crawls, things of that nature. Um, but yeah, I, I tend to recommend people steer clear of it if possible. Like it's, it's a neat user experience, but from the technical marketing side, other than the neat user experience, I think it potentially causes a lot of complications. You know, I've never, I've had the opposite experience. I've never had it cause an indexing issue. So I'd be interested to see how uh, that actually happened. The, the one thing I do notice with lazy load is that it, it, if you're a super image heavy site, um, it does help, especially like a, if you're doing a photographer's kind of site or web something like that. It does help with loading. Uh, sometimes user experience gets a little lag because it might be slower. Uh, but there are new options, uh, flying pages. Those guys, uh, they have flying images as well. And I think that handles lazy loading better than WP Rocket used to. WP Rocket standing up and actually doing a really good job for that. So I'd say if you're going to in implement it, W3 Total Cache has got it in there now, too. So uh, those guys have implemented it in a much more uh, effective way uh, that I think is certainly worthwhile to look at. But, yeah. Yeah, the indexing thing, I've never seen. I've never, honest, I can't well, say that I've never seen that happen. It's a hard problem to see. So you, you have to actually look to see if you have the issue, and a lot of people don't look, so it's out of sight, out of mind. What you want to look for like with the lazy load category is you have that lazy load page two, lazy load page three, show me in the web server logs that Google bot has actually paginated to those page two and page three and has seen that content. Cause oftentimes what happens is Google bot will hit page one of the category and it won't do the lazy load trigger. And so you won't see the lazy page two or lazy page three anywhere. And Googlebot's not going to sit on your page all day scrolling downward. They only allot uh, 1.2 CPU seconds of JavaScript execution time. So how many lazy loads can happen in 1.2 seconds before Google stops updating the page? So it's it's a difficult problem to know you have and you have to go specifically out of your way to see if it's there 
I don't, so you're talking lazy loading the page versus lazy loading an image? Well, let's say it's uh, uh, images. So uh, we're combining two things here. So you can lazy load the images of the product token, but you can also uh, infinite scroll, which is the page incarnation of lazy loading the content. So instead yeah. of having uh, pagination links, you scroll down and it dynamically puts more products into the category. Yep. Uh, so those are the two incarnations. And the, the question is, on either of them, in the actual web logs, can you verify that Googlebot saw the images and got to page two of that infinite scroll category? Because if you can't see Googlebot getting there, Googlebot's probably not getting there. It would be long. Wouldn't it it. still find the image in the DOM? Uh, not, not if it's not loaded. I mean, it has to load to be in the DOM. So that JavaScript has to execute and has to swap out the image source and show the image. Otherwise, it would all just load when document was ready. So... Yeah, you have to actually verify that the infinite scroll and the lazy load is actually being seen by Google Buy. And most people don't go that far, and then they don't even know they have the problem. Yeah, and I, I think I can see that with the, with the infinite scroll of the page and bringing in more categories over and over again. That I could see the indexing thing. That, that makes sense to me, but I've never seen it for images. Like if I lazy load my images, is that going to cause it? And I would think that if it did, it would only cause the indexing issue if I was worried about image SEO. You know what I mean? So if it's crawling the page and all the content, then do I really care if it's if it sees all my images? I mean, for AMP, you strip most of that crap out anyway for AMP stuff, and you still rank so. Uh, it's an interesting question. Yeah, yeah. You know, that that probably changes from person to person as to how important of an issue it is. Now, there are hard parts to tune regarding page speed. And these are the things that SEOs typically can't even touch. Like, you can mention it, but the business is going to look at you sideways if you make these recommendations. So you're probably better off just not even bringing them up, but it's good to know about them because you can escalate to their engineering team if they are an issue. But, you know, SEOs can't tell the business to get faster servers or to make the web application code faster or to make the database queries more optimized for performance or to get faster internet for the servers. You know, all these things affect your page load times, but they're kind of, you know, out of reach for SEOs to actually act on. Um, so most SEOs, they don't even think about them, and it's probably for the best that they don't, but they are part of the equation. And sometimes, you know, fairly rarely, something in this area goes wrong. Um, and it's good to be able to diagnose it. Like if if your web server for some unknown reason is just painfully slow, it's good to know that it's that hardware because then you have something to go investigate. Maybe something's running in the background on the server. You know, maybe it got hacked and there's malware running. Who knows? But sometimes something can go wrong with these things that would affect your page load time. But typically, what we as SEOs should be able to do in terms of technical page load time and optimizing is we should know when to recommend to a client that, hey, you should probably use a CDN. This would speed things up. We should know when to say, you know, hey, can you have your system admin turn on H2? We see that it's not on. And just changing that setting on the server could solve all of our page load, uh, page speed problems. Uh, should be able to request that, you know, things that are graphics that shouldn't be be converted 
should be able to request that images be resized or compressed. Uh, there is a compression setting in the server that sometimes isn't enabled by default. I think most modern web servers have compression enabled by default, but that's another problem that you might want to diagnose because sometimes engineers turn it off for various they forget to turn it back on. That can slow down your page loads. Uh, reducing that asynchronous request count. You know, one of the big culprits of that is Tag Manager. People just keep putting infinite, you know, snippets, cut and paste snippets into Tag Manager from this service, that service, and they let it accumulate for years. And some of the stuff, they don't even know what it does anymore, and they don't use it anymore, but it's still in there. And all that stuff is asynchronous requests that bog down your server. So you got to kind of be strict about all of uh, the things you include on a page and all the things you stuff into Tag Manager. You need to audit you know, all of that and reduce it whenever possible. Um, and then, yeah, you know, you should know when to see if caching is configured on a website. And if it's not, and it should be, you should be able to, to recommend that they uh, implement uh, caching. And then finally, for those parts of PageSpeed that we as SEOs can't touch, you need to know when to hand it off to engineers to do that performance tuning or to search for issues on the server. So you got to know where the line is, where, where it stops being your problem and starts being an engineer's problem. And so for page speed, you kind of need this palette of, of things to do. Like if I was doing a site speed audit, these are the things that I would go to and come back with and, and have recommendations about and, you know, some of these things would have huge impacts, like doing H2. I don't even need to touch the website, and I could potentially get a 10x improvement just by turning on that checkbox. And so these, these are the things that I would want you to know. These are the things that I would go to first in page speed. Is there anything that you guys would do that I didn't cover No, I think you pretty much hit everything. Um, I would also recommend that they go to the Google Chrome Developers Channel. Uh, the web, the crew for web.dev actually did a whole bunch of stuff too. And the, uh, day one is more interesting than day two by far. Um, but you can learn how to look at the Chrome Web Vitals uh, and deal with some of the stuff that goes hand in hand with this page speed stuff. And uh, in particular, one that I found interesting is the talk they did on uh, images and how to um, handle it. it was that the, the loading. Remember when, when the page loads, I forget the term, C C R L, I think it is. Uh, but basically if the page the website loads and then it shifts down, um, that uh, how to handle that and how to fix that with images, which goes hand in hand with the image optimization that you just talked about. Yeah, the only thing I was going to add, Ted, was that, um, and Clint touched on it, was the was the web vitals, and that Google has announced that this is going to be a big part of the algorithm in six months or so, or something like that. So it's the kind of thing. There's plenty of time. This is the kind of stuff that I have to pass off to somebody else because I don't have the time or the inclination. But um, there's enough time to do that to to figure some of these things out, and make sure that you're hitting those stuff, those important points that also then correspond with what they're looking for in those web vitals to make sure that your sites don't get left behind. Yeah. I just worry that the web vitals is going to be part of the algorithm, the way HTTPS was part of the algorithm for two weeks. And then it wasn't. <laughs> you never yeah. I, I have no doubt that that's what they're going to do with it. Uh, but you know, at any rate, there's information there and there's information here. And if you're doing audits and you have a page speed component to your audit, then these are probably considerations that you want to make sure are in that audit. 
And if, if you don't know how to look into these things, there are YouTube videos, there are blog posts, you can search them. Uh, you can join IMG and ask questions about them. Uh, if you're in a group, uh, uh, SIA or Signals Lab or one of those groups, you can ask questions about these things. There's bound to be dozens and dozens of people who know a thing or two about them. So uh, people always forget to ask questions, and that's really how you put a community to work for you. So I highly recommend that you join a community and you ask lots of questions. That's the smart thing to do. And uh, I guess with that, uh, we'll go to questions if there are any. Otherwise, we can go back to networking. Uh, let me take a look over at the Facebook side. Ted, is H2 HTTP slash 2? Um, you'd think it would be, but for some reason they just named it H2. But yeah, it's supposed to be the equivalent of that. Um, let's see. Questions. Uh, do you recommend WebP format for images? Um, you know, I've seen WebP around. I know that it's somewhat of a pain in the butt to work with if your uh, local software doesn't support it. So, you know, I guess it depends what software you have. I think for typical website visitors, it it probably doesn't matter too much. There are probably a few performance improvements for it. But I would guess that uh, compared to the other issues that we've mentioned, that's probably a tiny one. It probably wouldn't get you the biggest impact in terms of page speed. It might get you a teeny tiny impact in terms of page speed. Uh, but definitely, you know, converting 1,300 asynchronous requests down to 24 asynchronous requests, it's going to have a huge impact on your page speed. But changing a PNG file to a, a WebP file uh, probably is going to be a minuscule change. Ted, what do you think about hosting sites just on SW uh, on, on S3 just, just to just do that in general? Um, if your site is static, you can get away with that, but not all of us have that luxury of having a static website. So if you actually do need cookies for something, you probably don't want it out on S3. Uh, so for that reason, you still want to host your website somewhere, but you just want to minimize the static files that you're hosting. Get your static CSS files, your static JavaScript files, your static images, your web fonts, your fav icons, all that stuff can be put out on a CDN. And that way it doesn't uh, clog up your log files and you get the optimal uh, file transfer off of the CDN. What do you think of Cloudflare as a CDN? Um, you know, I like Cloudflare until I need to scale and then it kind of becomes cost prohibitive for me. So for my bigger applications, I can't use it. It's too expensive. But for my smaller projects, it tends to be free or close to free. So I, I think it really depends on your situation. And Ted, there's one last question in here on... um in the Q and A on, on, uh, in the room, it, it's this takeaway you've just mentioned, should it be all product related? The person says they mean those products on the same page, like tennis shoes, uh, and not tennis shoes and socks. I'm not sure. It seems like it's from an e-com. I think it might've been maybe from the one, <laughs> maybe our last episode. So never mind. Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, if you have a question about ecom like that, just find me over at IMG. I'd be happy to give you a detailed answer there. Cool. I think that's it. That's in the room. 
All right, let's see. Um, do you uh, recommend font swap or fallback for font optimization? Um, you know, uh, I, I don't think that will have too much impact. So what, what he's talking about there is what happens when the client-side browser doesn't have the font you're trying to use. And typically in CSS, you can give a list and then it'll fall back <laughs> across that list. Uh, I think that's more of a, a style thing. I think uh, most people are using uh, web fonts for anything non-standard, and the standard fonts are typically everywhere. Um, and if you're being explicit with web fonts, you don't need fallbacks because you're giving a URL to the exact font they need. Um, so I, I, it's probably a no-op, but, you know, that you could test it to be sure. I don't think it'll help page speed much. Um, let's see. Are there issues with uh, GZIP and SSL? Um, not that I know of. Uh, a lot of people worry about uh, uh, SSL handshake times. And the thing about SSL is that it gets cached. When we mention that caching, so slow SSL only affects new visitors once. And then after that, it's cached. They end up getting the two millisecond uh, SSL handshakes because all, uh, all the certificates and everything are, are already cached locally. Um, and in terms of GZIP on the server and SSL, no, thousands of websites do that every day and no problems. So I haven't haven't heard of an issue there. And do you guys recommend any specific CDN services? Uh, I I'm really impressed with with S3. It's pretty easy to use, and I can't complain about the price. Uh, you know, I'm astonished when my uh, CDM bill is above a dollar. So, uh, you know, take that for. For what it's worth, I I think it's amazing. Yeah, um, I combine I combine S three with Cloudflare and leverage both of those together. And it's awesome. What's what's your uh, CDN uh, bill like? Oh, like fifteen cents a month. Yeah. <laughs> so I mean, it, cost is not the reason you're not moving to a CDN because it, it's the cheapest part of. AWS is the, the S3 CDN service. Um, let's see. Yeah, I think that's it. So we'll call that a show. Uh, any final thoughts, Clint? No, it was good. I enjoyed it. I learned a lot. Uh, picked up some things and some things to test. So I'm looking forward to it. Awesome. How about you, Kyle? Same for me. Uh, it's one of those ones I'll go back through and rewatch. Or for or pay somebody else to rewatch you. Go, yeah, go get ideas. You know, one once a year we ought to just go through a section of SEO and just say this is what should be on your your audit checklist. So we'll revisit this one in six months to a year and and see how wrong we were. <laughs> Perfect. All right, guys. Thanks a lot. All right. See you.